Good morning, Calvary. Praise the Lord today. It's a beautiful morning, and we have a Savior who loves us in beautiful ways. We learn that today as we celebrate Pentecost, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we get going. But first of all, I just wanted to announce that uh, the Sunday school class uh, that Gary Merka teaches is starting a new study in the Gospel of Luke. We realized last week that we had spent probably a year in the book of Genesis and we got through I think 29 or 30 chapters. So there's some real good discussion that goes on there but we decided to make a switch to the New Testament for a while so you are all welcome to join us. We do have a really fruitful discussion as we get into God's Word together so that's available just a new study in the same group but anyone is always welcome to take part. Thank you. Jamie's class will be in the Gospel of John. So God is leading us to the Gospels. We'll see what he wants to teach us in there. Luke is a very methodical, orderly Gospel. John uh, tends to run a little bit differently. So there are some very different uh, things that you can learn in those two groups, but we invite you to take part uh, in those discussions. And we also want to uh, remember in prayer uh, the people and family at the Cornerstone Church this morning uh, for the tragedy that took place there last week. Uh, lots of young people were there, and I think that whole church family and that piece of the body of Christ in Ames really needs our prayers as they uh, plan funerals and uh, recover from that. So keep them in your prayers. Today you see the red up on the altar and the Pentecost on the screens. That is the uh, holiday that we're celebrating today in the church, which basically began as a Jewish feast, one of the three feasts where people were required to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And so they were there for uh, Passover, they were there for the Feast of uh, First Fruits, and then this one is the Feast of Weeks. And so God orchestrated so many things so that the most people possible were in Jerusalem to hear the good news when the Holy Spirit came down. And it was also for the Jews a celebrating of the giving of the law from uh, Sinai on uh, the mountain where Moses was given the Ten Commandments and the law. So the Jews were celebrating that. All the male Jews are required to be in Jerusalem. And at that time, uh, the law was ushered in, but also grace was ushered in in the birth of the church. So how God weaves everything together through the scriptures is just uh, amazing. And we'll learn more about that as the day goes on. But that is the focus for the day, taking a break from the series on spiritual warfare to celebrate the birthday of the church and the giving of the Holy Spirit. So with those thoughts, we will be singing um, number 500 as a prayer, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. So I invite you to stand if you are able. It's number 500. <laughs> Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Bring it from earth, through all its pulses move. Stoop to my weakness, 
please be seated. Scripture lesson today comes from the book of Acts. This is chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. Acts 2, 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound, like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. At this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each one of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We Americans are obsessed with power. I love power. Um, guys especially. We guys, we like things with power. Uh, we're not satisfied with a car that will do 120 miles per hour. We want a car that will go from 0 to 120 in less than 6.2 seconds. Hand tools aren't enough for us either. What do we want? We want power tools. And battery operated, plug them in, more power. You remember the, the Tim the two man, Tool Man Taylor from the old Home Improvement uh, series on television? That was his mantra, wasn't it? More power. And he souped up everything from his lawnmower to his bathroom and even Christmas decorations. But guys aren't the only ones who like power. Men and women alike are interested in faster, more powerful computers and time-saving gadgets for use around the house. But it's not just powerful gadgets we're after. We also want power over our circumstances. We want power in our relationships. And we want power in our spiritual life. It's that last one that I want to focus on this morning. My Many people have grown tired of powerless, 
safe religion. Religion that is innocuous, that um, doesn't do any harm, but doesn't do any good either. Whether they realize it or not, they want to feel the power that Jesus said would be ours if we would bring our lives to Him, give our lives to Him. But how can we experience this power? The answer is embedded in our Scripture passage this morning. So let's see what it has to tell us about God's power on this Pentecost Sunday. Uh, Verse 1 tells us that when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Now the day of Pentecost was so-called because it fell on the 50th day after the presentation of the first sheaf to be reaped at the barley harvest. That is, the 50th day from the first Sunday after Passover. It was a Jewish holiday. It still is a Jewish holiday. We Christians, uh, because of the significance of what happened on that particular Pentecost Sunday, uh, have made it our own as well. But among Hebrew and Aramaic-speaking Jews, it was known as the Feast of Weeks and also as the Day of of the first fruits, because on that day, the first fruits of wheat harvest were presented to God. So it was a very significant holiday, a a very important one. And on this particular day of Pentecost that we read about in Acts chapter 2, the followers of Jesus were all in one place. Note, uh, either this was a very large place or it was a very small group. It says all of the followers of Jesus were in one place. Acts 1.15 tells us that there were 120 persons in all. It's not very many when you consider that, that Jesus ministered for three years, had lots of crowds follow him. Uh, but apparently, only 120 people were committed, at least in that area. And even though Verse 1 doesn't tell us what place they were in. We can assume that it is the upper room that is mentioned in Acts 1.13. So all of the disciples that Jesus had accumulated over the three years of ministry, only 120, were together in one place. Most likely the upper room uh, is where they were, were staying. The question is, What were they doing? They were all in one place, but were they sitting there twiddling their thumbs? What were they doing? Well, the verse doesn't tell us, but I think we can come up with a pretty good guess based on what we learn in Acts chapter 1. After Jesus rose from the grave, He presented Himself to His disciples over 40 days, and then while He was Staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So one thing that they were doing in the upper room is that they were waiting. They were waiting. And I can guarantee you, they didn't like to wait any more than we do. We hate waiting, don't we? We hate waiting at traffic lights. We hate waiting for more than 30 seconds for our food at the drive-thru. We hate waiting for more than two seconds for information to come up on our computers. In an instant age, we are not used to waiting. We are used to getting what we want now in seconds rather than minutes. But Jesus' disciples weren't living in an instant age, were they? But they had been waiting a long, long time for God to do something. For God to free them from Roman oppression. They had suffered for so long. And they wanted Him to restore the kingdom. The kingdom of Israel. Bring back the glory days. So when they gathered to see Jesus off on Ascension Day, 
they asked him a, an important question. They said, is this the day? Is this it? Is this when we'll usher in the kingdom? Is this when you're going to show up with power? And we expected you to do it before you died, but you didn't do it. But, but now that you've risen again, may, certainly this is the time. And Jesus' response is frustrating for those of us who want answers. He said, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by His own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be My witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So there they were on that day of Pentecost. The disciples were in the upper room together Waiting. Waiting for the power that Jesus promised that was on the way. But they were also doing something else. Acts chapter 1 and 12, starting with verse 12 and following, tells us that after Jesus ascended to heaven, the disciples returned to Jerusalem, went to the upper room where they were staying, and with one accord... They were devoting themselves to prayer. Devoting themselves to prayer. Every single day, while they were waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit to come, the promise to be fulfilled, they were devoted to prayer. And there's no reason to believe that they weren't praying together on that particular Pentecost Sunday. And their waiting and their praying set the stage for what happened next. Beginning in verse 2, we read, And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now when the um, text tells us the disciples were speaking in tongues, other tongues, um, we get this image of, of people uh, in Pentecostal churches, especially that uh, that speak in tongues that that we nobody understands, there is strange, mysterious language. But that's not what the text means here when he, when it says that they were speaking in tongues. They, these weren't un, uh, unintelligible mystery languages. And we get that understanding from what follows. Uh, there were people from all over the known world in Jerusalem. Presumably, there for the celebration of Pentecost. So these were probably, many of them at least, Jews from other parts of the world. And the people began to take notice that yeah, this is strange. They said, you know, these, these people pouring out of this house, uh, they're speaking uh, in their own language, but we're hearing them in our language. This is incredible. You see, they understood them. They understood what was being said. But others were not convinced that they were seeing and hearing a miracle. Other people said, oh, they're just drunk. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. And at that, Peter stood up and he addressed the crowd. The same Peter, by the way, uh, who cow was cowardly when Jesus was being tried, denied Jesus three times, didn't have the guts to stand up for Jesus then. But now, he does stand up. And he says, look, these people aren't drunk. It's only the third hour of the morning, which is about nine o'clock. Um, and what you're seeing is the beginning of the fulfillment of prophecy. 
It's the beginning of the last days. God proclaimed through the prophet Joel that his spirit would be poured out on all flesh, great and small, rich and poor, men and women, servants and free people alike. And you'll see and hear even greater things in the days ahead. And all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. What made Peter able to stand up and proclaim that in front of all of these people when he couldn't stand up to a little servant girl as other bystanders on the day before Jesus' death? The difference is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. He was emboldened by the Holy Spirit. The disciples waited, they prayed, and they received power. That power that God that had promised them, Jesus had promised them. And they were empowered to do what they had never been able to do before. The Holy Spirit came into their lives. Now, there are some important principles that we should do, we would do well to clean from this scripture passage. First, we need to wait for God's empowerment. I don't know about you, but I hate to hear that. I hate to even utter it. I hate waiting. I, I want to do things now. I, I have these visions of. of what we can do as Christians, what this church can do, and you do as well. Before he sent it, Jesus could have told his disciples, all right, guys, I've taught you for three years. Now it's time for you to put some feet to what I told you to do. Get, get going. Get out there. Run with it. Develop a few programs. Build, build that church up. He could have said that, but he didn't. He said, wait. Wait for what? Wait for empowerment. Wait for the Holy Spirit to show up, to fill you up, and to show you what we want you to do. I've got to tell you today, uh, the church tends to run ahead of God. Uh, churches, and uh, we... we Leaders in churches, we, we think, okay, we've got this great idea, and so you know, let's add another program. Let's let's um, do things. Show God what we can do. Instead of waiting, and asking God what He's empowered us to do. The problem is that we tend to rely on human-made resources rather than God's power. What ends up happening is that we become anemic, powerless churches. I mean, people may flock to churches with lots of innovative programs, but if those programs aren't filled with the Holy Spirit, they will not see transformed lives, which is, which is what God really wants to see. So we must wait for a word from God and the power from God if we are going to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. But, but please know that we are not to wait passively. We must pray fervently, passionately, and continually for the Spirit's empowerment. Acts doesn't tell us what the disciples were praying for in the upper room between Jesus' day of ascension and the day of Pentecost. But I believe they were primarily praying for power. They were praying for, for God to deliver on that promise of power. And they were probably praying that Jesus would come back again. Brothers and sisters, prayer is so essential to, to what we do. A, a prayerless church is a powerless church powerless pastor is a powerless pastor. Uh, and you can make, continue the list. See, computers are, 
are amazing things. Frustrating things, but amazing things. Um, and they're capable of doing uh, things in seconds that it takes, in my mind at least, uh, minutes, hours, days to come up with. But you know, the thing about computers is they don't do much if they're not plugged into a power source. Yes, I know we got laptops where they have a battery, but you know, you got to charge that battery up, right? So it has to be plugged into the power. And the same is true for the church and for individual Christians. We have to be plugged into God's power. And how do we do that? We pray. I guarantee you that you are not reaching your full spiritual potential if you are not praying daily. Uh, I know some people think that you know a couple minutes of prayer in the morning and before you go to bed, maybe at meals, is, is enough. But it's really not. It's really not. Jim Cimbala uh, is the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York. At least I think he is. Uh, he's been there a long time, so he may have retired. But um, I've read three of his books and have heard him speak on a number of occasions. And one of the things he is fond of pointing out is that the church was not born during a clever sermon. It was born in a prayer meeting. If we try to move forward without making prayer the centerpiece of who we are and what we do as a church, we're doomed to failure. It'll never work. If you haven't noticed, we're a small church. Uh, humanly speaking, we shouldn't even be operating. But with God's power, God has this amazing ability to use small things, weak things, because he wants to show up with his strength and his power. The 120 disciples huddled together in that upper room before Pentecost didn't stand a chance against the Roman Empire. Humanly speaking, they didn't have a chance. They had to wait for and pray for God's power to arrive. And when it arrived, they turned the world upside down. The Roman Empire didn't have a chance against them. So constant, fervent prayer will shift us from a survival mentality, many small churches have, to receive that endless power of God. But I want you to notice that power is not something we grab. It's not something we try to to grasp. Power is received. Did you catch that? In Acts 1 8, you will, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So God's power is something we ask for and wait for, it's not something we demand, it's not something we manufacture for ourselves. A lot of people want power today and they are going to go get it. But it will fail them in the end. This scripture passage answers a very important question for the church today. How will we know when we have received God's power? How do we know? Church growth alone is not a sure sign that God's power is active in a church. You can, you can grow a church with good programs, a charismatic leader. I know lots of church leaders who know the right levers to pull and the right buttons to push to capture the imagination of the surrounding culture. You really can grow a large church without the Holy Spirit. It just won't do much. It won't be healthy. So how will we know when the Holy Spirit comes in power? We will see signs and wonders. 
You'll th- see things that cannot be explained apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. We will still see things that people will marvel at. They will say, how did that small church accomplish that? Humanly speaking, it is impossible. And that's the point. God wants to get the glory. We will see transformed lives. God's power mediated through the Holy Spirit is meant to do more than just make people nice. It is meant to transform them. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You'll see answers to prayer that are unexplainable. We will see this little church do things that are humanly impossible. We'll see a supernatural love for each other. Some people are easier to love than others. But everybody will be loved because we will have that supernatural ability to love. Now I can't promise that we will see 3,000 people added to our numbers, but I believe that people are hungry to experience God's power in their lives. And if they see it in in a church, any size church, I want to be a part of that. So would you like to see, experience God's power in your life? Connect to the power source. The only one who can give you that true power. And the only way you can do that is to be together in prayer. I mean, literally, like this group of 120 people, gathering together as a church for prayer, but also but also individually. I still believe that God has a lot of work for us to do for this little church. I think if we plug into His power, we will see incredible things. So let's discover that together, shall we? Let's pray. Father, we see um, this scripture. I don't know about anybody else, but I get excited about the possibilities. I yearn for the experience with these disciples, a small group of disciples experienced. I long for the power. Lord, I know that my prayer life is so roller coasterish. It is up one day and down the, the next, and I'm really uh, at the mercy of my uh, emotions and feelings. I pray, Lord, that you will Build us up. Help us to draw together, to pray together, to search the Scriptures together, to be part of the building of your kingdom here on earth, having an impact on our culture. Lord, we wait. We don't want to run ahead of you. Show us. Show us why we're here. Lord, as we focus on uh, the birth of your church on this Pentecost Sunday, we want to remember our uh, brothers and sisters who are suffering elsewhere. Lord, we pray for um, the people who uh, belong to the community of Cornerstone Church. Lord, we pray that... um, those who uh, witnessed the shooting on Friday, on Thursday, that that were there that day and were traumatized, Lord, I pray that your supernatural peace, 
come over them. I pray for the families, the two young women. Pray that you will wrap them in your supernatural grace that they will grieve, but not as those without hope. And Lord, I pray for Pastor Mark and his staff. That you will build them up, strengthen them for this incredibly difficult time of ministry. So even as they gather today, Lord, help them. Help them as they grieve. And Lord, we pray for the church around the world, places where they're experiencing persecution, where it is not safe to gather, and yet they still do. I pray that you will build them up, give them increased courage and power so that Satan will be on the run. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. And Lord, as we approach the communion table, I pray that you will search our hearts, enable us to experience your forgiveness as we confess our sins to you because you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. And in his name, we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Communion, uh, I will be using the uh, Great Thanksgiving for the Day of Pentecost. Um, didn't get those in your bulletins. Uh, but if you turn in your hymnal to uh, uh, page 15, 15 and 16, you have the responses, uh, the appropriate responses for the uh, Thanksgiving, and you have the prompts. So I invite you to uh, follow along there. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning, your spirit moved over the face of the waters. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. Your Spirit came upon prophets and teachers, anointing them to speak your word. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. At his baptism in the Jordan, your Spirit descended upon him and declared him your beloved Son. With your Spirit upon him, he turned away the temptations of sin your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, 
to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always, baptizing us with the Holy Spirit and with fire, as on the day of Pentecost. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised, raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood and empowered by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, showing forth the fruit of the Spirit until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. A reminder, in the United Methodist Church, we serve open communion. You do not have to be a member of this church uh, or our denomination. And we just ask that you be uh, a follower of Jesus Christ, that uh, you are committed to following him and uh, are seeking uh, redemption from your sins and uh, seek to love each other with, uh, as yourself and you know, the Lord God uh, with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. So uh, we will, uh, the way we practice communion, you come to the, uh, the rail when we're directed. Would you? So when Gary uh, dismisses your row, you can come up and uh, you can kneel or you can stand um, and then I will um, serve you. We will all... Uh, take the bread together and uh, take the cup together. So you would hold it. And if uh, you are unable uh, to come up and would like uh, community to be brought to you, Cindy will do that after um, the first group comes.
and the blood of Christ was shed for you. Take and drink in remembrance of him. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. body was broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of him. Christ's blood was shed for you. Take and drink in remembrance of him. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Steve talked in the message about having a transformed life, and our closing hymn, especially verse 3, uh, expresses that in a prayer. Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am wholly thine, that all this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine. Let us join together in uh, number 420, Breathe on me, breath of God. Please stand.
one thing I, I forgot to pray for during the, the pastoral prayer is the annual conference is going on right now. Uh, we, we started the work yesterday, and uh, actually the laity session was on Friday. Uh, but the ordering of, of ministry service is going on um, right now, um, and we'll pick up with uh, more uh, business and legislation this afternoon, but, and it will conclude this afternoon. So pray for wisdom uh, for our church, our denomination, uh, on this Pentecost Sunday, um, that we will make wise decisions um, and good ones. So, and now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen. invite you downstairs for fellowship also this morning. Uh, we will be honoring some of our unsung heroes at the coffee today. So we invite you to come down and express your gratitude for our uh, tech team upstairs and all that they do for us week in and week out behind the scenes. So come and join us downstairs. <laughs> <laughs>